suffering person who's in pain. Hi everybody, welcome to It's All Right with Suzette, a half hour show on the craft of writing. And our special featured guest today is Diana B. Roberts, our very own from Milton, an author who wrote Farago, a memoir of Marky and me. And it's a very interesting, revealing, vulnerable book. And before we get into it, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Dina, as she prefers to be called. Um, for 25 years, she's been a successful uh, professional development. Um, she's had a very successful career as a development officer and fundraiser. Currently, she works for the Boston Conservatory, and her past career has included some of the largest institutions in Boston. She served in the Peace Corps before earning a BA in communications from Drake University. And she was a journalist working as a features editor in Tokyo for um, Yomuru, Yo, Yomiyori Shimbun. Yes, <laughs> a major Japanese English newspaper. Milton is her hometown where she lives with her husband, Bob Bray. And today we have her today to talk about her memoir. Welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. You make me sound good. <laughs> <laughs> you are good. I read your book and I really enjoyed it. Um, first of all, Farago, a memoir of Marky and me. What is the meaning of Farago and why did you choose that word to be in your title? Um, it's interesting. There's an old little thing where you have words for the day with a dictionary, little pages you turn off. And about 30 years ago, I found the word Farago. It means, uh, from the Latin, a bunch of sticks or a confused mixture of things, and uh, the British started using it in the 17th century. So Farago is a confused mixture, and the memory of my mother is that. It's neither positive or negative, but kind of a murky mixture of things. Well, I think you do a very good job of capturing a conflicted relationship with your mother, who in the book you reveal has mental illness. So tell us a little bit about what your book is about. Um, it's a book about surviving uh, a family with mental illness, and it's a book for anybody who didn't have a mother. So I lived with my mother for a short period of time, and she was ill from her teenage years and grew worse with the birth of each child, each of my siblings. So she was not there for most of my life, and that's what I write about surviving. And um, can you describe your mother? You know, in the book, she very much comes alive, but for our viewers here, you know, give us a little snapshot of your mom. What is the gray, what is that movie, gray? My mother had this incredible old New York accent. Darling, you look wonderful today. And she would have on a baseball cap and a blue jean jacket and white powder all over her face and would wander the streets of New York. So that is kind of my memory of my mother. And the few times I visited her in New York and would take her out to lunch. Um, she was pretty strange, but um, she uh, managed to live to 85 and die very quietly and like an old aristocratic New Yorker. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, in your relationship with your mom, um, the dialogue that you use really captures her character, you know, that old aristocratic New York accent. And she always refers to you in the most superlative of terms, my darling little girl, my love. And yet you ha felt very little for her throughout your childhood. That's true. Um, she, she, as a young, as a, as a mother, she was best with little kids because she was so childlike herself. Mm -hmm. So she always treated me like I was a little kid and told me I was fabulous. So my inner side got a lot of self-confidence. But growing up with a mentally ill mother attending uh, Milton Academy, you always wondered, does everybody know? Does everybody know? So it was a very conflicted kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the book really because the shadow was with me for a long time. and. Once you write a memoir, um, the shadow's over there. It's not a part of you anymore. So it's kind of freeing. And I think in those days, mental illness was very much a hush-hush kind of thing. It was a very difficult thing to talk about or to reveal or share with other people. And when you say that, um, you know, 
not being with your mom and you know way in many ways you write for the reader for a lot of readers who didn't grow up where their mother was absent right lot of ways you know how did that affect you exactly well i have two daughters and i did not really know how was i doing as a mom because i didn't really have one mm -hmm. so that was interesting and uh, um, uh, I think, too, my mom's mental illness started when she was a senior in high school, and it was during the Depression. Mm -hmm. And she was used to being a kind of a debutante, and they lost their money. So I think that the combination of circumstances kind of sent her initially over the edge. And then when each of the children was born, it got to be worse. So when I had children, I had no role models, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, as it turned out, okay, but, you know, you never really knew how you were doing. Yeah, I understand. You know, I, uh, my mother had a nervous breakdown when she was, when I was 15. And so I do understand, you know, that whole, um, like Phil Donahue, you know, how am I doing? You know, right. Don't that know. Whole, you're kind of cast adrift and you don't have anything to compare it to and, and all of that. You know, it's interesting that in your book, you don't, you don't ever call your mother mom. You call her Marky. Uh, no one ever called my mother mom. It was always Marky. Uh, my grandmother called her Marky. Um, my father called her Marky, obviously. But we never, I think it does have something to do with not being mothered, that she was always like over there or institutionalized. So mm -hmm. she was Marky, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the, it's very um, um, poignant, you know, many chapters in your book where you see her going back into the hospital or, you know, you're simply told she's going away for a while. You know, in what way do you feel that that has affected you in later life? What do you feel, what areas of your life do you feel you actively had to heal? Well, I am a firm believer that whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I've had two hip replacements and I play tennis. So I, I think that over time you just kind of stroke yourself until you, until you can be strong enough to do the things you have to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think, uh, I was in the Peace Corps, and she used to write to me constantly and say, mm -hmm. oh, how wonderful that you've done that, but don't marry an African. I mean, she was very, she had some weird things about her, but. Um, well, that was the time back then. Yeah, I, I think because I had to do so much on my own, it just, it made me stronger. Mm -hmm. you, have, you were very close to your dad, though. You know, what was your dad like? My dad um, was a dream of a guy, he was as, sweet as he was good looking. Um, he was an 11 letter athlete at Harvard, but he was raised in Milton. He, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yes he was. And um, the things that were hard to understand is he married someone who'd been mentally ill in her teens. That wasn't a very smart thing to do. Yet he was a single parent with me and my two brothers in the 1950s, which was an incredibly wonderful thing to do. Um, in the book I talk about the stepmother I inherited um, through his marriage to my mother's classmate from high school. So that was not an easy time. So there were things that I didn't really have answers for about my dad, but I did love him very much. And uh, in the story, he dies on Christmas Day, so while I'm in the Peace Corps. Yes, and you were very close to your grandmother, Muffy, who pretty much raised you. No, that's my, gra my grandmother, Pierce Roberts. Oh, the other grandmother. The other grandmother. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's right. So you were raised by her, and your mother's mother was Muffy. Yes. Yes. And what was your relationship with her? She was in New York. Well, she was she was pretty odd. She drove a pink Cadillac, and the day I g landed in New York to go in the Peace Corps to Tunisia, North Africa, she brought me a huge Whitney sampler. What was it called? Whitman sampler. Whitman sampler full of vitamins, because she was convinced that if I took the right vitamins, I would not be crazy like my mother, and that my mother had not taken the right vitamins. She didn't, she didn't always get that, as they didn't back then, that mental illness is more than vitamins and hormones. Mm -hmm. And you know, the book opens up with the death of your yes. mom, and your ambivalence. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, my mother died at the Deaconess Needham Hospital on referral from the Phillips House at MGH, which she loved because it was for upper class ladies, and I was born there. Um, and when she died, it's true, I was the first person out of the room, 
the nurse said, you can stay as long as you want, and I just wanted to get out of there. And the next day was the marathon on April 16th in 2002, and uh, I wanted to be in the marathon. I didn't want to have to prepare her farewell. And my brothers were much more, um, they knew much less about her, actually, so they were really? actually more, more in tune and more well, uh, you know, happy to do that, whereas I was really very ambivalent. And I think writing the book helped got, get over some of that. Well, you know, that was the first chapter, and that's what really hooked me, because I felt that you were so honest. You know, here your mom had died, and the fact that you rarely saw her throughout your life because of her mental illness made you ambivalent, you know, at her death. And I thought that it was such a very, it was a very raw and revealing way to open up a book. Oh, thank you. I did. And, you know, I think that... Um, there are a lot of lessons also for the modern family because you know the modern family in many ways is split up and fractured and and perhaps there are many children that don't get to see you know a particular parent as much as they'd like or whatever you know what you know what do you feel were the le are the lessons that you're imparting from this book well <clears throat> i have two daughters you know and they they always thought i was so out there and i guess i was out there in what way you know i was always running up and down the soccer field or, you know, chasing some donor or whatever. And, um, you know, I went through divorce. And it's interesting now that um, I'm older and they're older, I think they see their mother as a much stronger person than they realized. Mm -hmm. So I, I do take that away from writing this book. Um, and uh, I just, I feel a lot more whole. And I know that I have a number of people uh, Women friends who are tennis players have, you know, called me and said, thank you so much because I have my own issues with my mother and this helped me. So that's good. Yes, it was really a great book to read. Um, now, you mentioned that it might, earlier when we were talking, that it might be a springboard to another book that you're working on? Absolutely. Just like old singers who reissue their records, that's the same old songs. You can't do that. So I'm writing a, a new book called Three Times a Lady from the Lionel Richie song uh, about portraits of three marriages in different cultural periods in this country. The 60s, the hippie marriage, the 70s, the yuppie marriage, and the 90s, the companionship marriage. So uh, it's a really about a writer who wanted to be a writer, but life and three marriages got in the way. So. It, when she turns 70, she starts writing again. And yes, it's fictional, but yes, they are my marriages. Oh, that's, that's going to be a really interesting <laughs> book. You know, was it difficult to, um, you know, to, to reveal these painful episodes in your life? You know what? Um, I always wanted to be a writer. I mean, I always was a writer, but I wanted to be an author. So I just started writing after I reread all my diaries. I was not thinking about this as revealing mm -hmm. until after I edited a number of drafts. And then sometimes I would sit there and cry. But when I was writing it, I no, it was I want to be a writer. I want to be an author. I want to publish. That was my drive. It was very competitive about myself. It wasn't until afterwards that I reflected that, oh, that was kind of an exorcism, or that was kind of a catharsis. I didn't really get it. Um, I sing in a choir, and sometimes when we sing, I get so um, deep into it that I can't remember what I sang afterwards because it's mm -hmm. so intense. It's like a dream. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and writing that book was really about writing. Yes. And, uh, you know, I had a couple of people read it, and I was very trepidatious in the beginning, and then as I got good feedback, I uh, got more emboldened. But it wasn't until afterwards that I really saw, wow, that was probably an important thing to do. How cathartic. That's really cathartic. And you know, in a little while, we're going to return to talking to Diana B. Roberts about her book, Farago, and the writing process. Because I'm always interested in the behind the scenes action and experiences. Because the memoir that you wrote is so compelling and so honest. And I, it really is a page turner. And so we want to know more about what you went through to bring this baby to birth. Okay, so in a little while we'll return. We'll see you in a bit.
everybody. Welcome back to It's All Right with Suzette with our special guest, Diana B. Roberts, the author of Farrago, Memories of Marky and Me. And we're going to talk now about your writing process. And, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of curious because I think that as writers, we draw from all kinds of experiences in our life. And you've had a very long and successful career as a professional um, development officer and fundraiser. That's a lot of writing and communication. So, and you've done that for 25 years. In what way did that kind of um, writing, or did it, come to bear or influence your memoir? Well, the process of writing you, your memoir. You probably have heard of the writer Colette, whose husband used to lock her up in a room and tell her she couldn't come out until she wrote. I just want to say my husband spent a lot of time encouraging me to write, and he's great. So um, writing for development is really very repetitive. Thank you so much for your donation. Da, 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 da. Um, for me, um, I always wanted to write. Mm -hmm. but uh, And I, I did publish a short story. I did some writing for the Washington Post um, social section. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to write something authentic. And so uh, I really wanted to be a published author. I have this quirky thing where I can just go up to my room at 8 o'clock in the morning and not come down till 6. You're in the zone. Yeah, I can get in the zone. Even though I'm a very outgoing person, I would say that development writing I is not really an influence. This writing was an escape from development writing. I mean, development is a wonderful and authentic profession, but it's, 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 um, it doesn't cre create your creative juices. Tennis does it for me, sports. Um, and just the love of words. I, I'm also a pretty good linguist. I, I did speak French and Arabic in the Peace Corps, and the sound of words is always. And Japanese. Uh, go to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a long time ago. And I like to sing, not necessarily well, mm -hmm. but music and words do it for me. The actual act of writing sentences, I really love to do. Even though I'm a big talker, I can go up there and just do that. The other thing is, I'm a good storyteller, and so a lot of what I write is a story. Not every phrase is great, but the stories are pretty good because I've done a lot of different things. And when you decided to write this memoir, you know, you drew from journals? Yes, I've kept a journal since I was 15. Uh, everywhere I went in the world, Japan, coming home across from east to west, um, during being married, um, working. Um, there are things in my journals that say, I hate this. <laughs> um, and then there's just always an observation. I, I didn't write a journal that goes, today I ate bananas. Uh, my journals are really reflective of the things that happened in my life, uh, screaming about my stepmother or the headmistress of the academy or whatever. So um, I had a chance to go back and read them when I had a hip replacement because I couldn't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, that's got me started. And uh, I, I wish I had more time on a daily basis to write. Um, I'm going to do that this summer. Um, I, I forgot to mention that the, the p these covers. I was going to ask oh. you about how you chose the artwork for your book cover. Well, I did those paintings in, in oil. And I did them actually huh? in Quincy with Edwina Kati, who's a portraitist. And she would walk around and just look at my stuff. So, so you're a painter also. I haven't done it in a number of years, but this one I did uh, in the Hamptons one year, and it's it's kind of surreal because the car mm -hmm. and that stuff. And this one is a picture of my mother as a disappearing act. It's um, a clothes rack and barely seeing her, and and she was a disappearing mom. So that was done maybe 20 years ago. They're really great. And They're great paintings. Thank you. Um, the, uh, I, would, I would hand that to iUniverse to, to pick, to juxtapose them like that. I sent them two, and I said, pick one, and they said, well, we like them both. So, Now, out of all the ideas, book ideas and concepts, was it, were you, did you always know that this is the book you wanted to write, or did you have a whole bunch of different ideas? No. How did you come to do the memoir? I this particular, it's very specific. Yeah, a long time ago, I read an article by Gloria Steinem, and she wrote a book about her mother. I don't know if it was a long article or a book about her mother who couldn't sing her own song, and I think her mother was mentally ill. And so, in the back of my mind, I always thought 
because my mother really was a recluse, you know, she didn't have a life that somehow I would expose her, not negatively or positively, but in a farrago. And so it was always there. And as I say, I found that word 25 years ago. And I kept stories and snippets about things. Uh, when I was 18, I ran off and joined, an, uh, joined a carnival called Kino Entertainment, which is still around. And I wrote a short story about the carnival. So I've always been kind of writing. But to be an author is very different. Oh, it's wonderful. Now, um, in your research to put this book together, you know, yep. you drew on journals that you've kept since you were 15. Did you find it necessary to talk to your siblings or to relatives? Well, it's very interesting. Um, uh, I have two brothers, uh, a stepsister who's four years older that I reconnected with after 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, a stepbrother who lives in, I have not seen since who was in my class at Milton, I haven't seen in many, many years. And I have a half-sister who's mentally handicapped. So um, I didn't really talk to my brothers who live near here. But after I wrote this book, and my cousin Edith, who lives here in Milton, they all started talking to me about things they didn't seem to remember that I did. My brothers, because you see in the book, they were, they were taken by my, my mother to live in New York, and so I didn't see them for four or five years. They don't really remember anything in their lives before the age of 11. Really? But I remember everything back to the age of two. So they were very um, inquisitive after the fact. Yes. And I didn't really share, I didn't really share with anybody that I was writing this book. I did take a Grub Street class one day mm. for, an, for a Saturday, and I knew that I had the sensibility of a writer just being in that class, and I could see who didn't. Mm -hmm. So that that encouraged me. But no, I didn't really talk to anybody. I, um, after I did this book for two and a half years, and I sent a draft to my dear friend Sidney Kenyon, and I just waited for an email that would say, you idiot, what are you doing? And I got back this email four days later that must have been six inches long that said, I can't believe you're even alive, and what a great thing you did. And then it talked about things she didn't think were necessary, and it was very good editing. And then my classmate Jim Kaplan from Milton Academy, who wrote for Sports Illustrated for 25 years, I gave him this draft, and God bless him, he read every line and every compound noun that needed to be split up, and he read the whole thing, and he, he got back to me for free and said, you know, if you were a celebrity, this would be a bestseller, but you're a first-time author, so you're going to have to publish this yourself. So that's kind of what I did. That's interesting because I was going to ask you how you came to publish it yourself through iUniverse. You know, um, I think part of being a writer is being very brave and telling people things they haven't heard before. And it can be very scary when you put yourself out there. Oh, yes. And I know that there is an episode in your book where your mother loses reality um, in that scene and she holds your head underwater in a dirty, in a dirty toilet. Mm -hmm. And it was really just so shocking and scary and nauseating because, you know, you were really young. So, you know, how did you, was it difficult, you know, when you, when you had to relive those memories in your mind in order to write, write that chapter? I know I scared a few friends. <laughs> um, I have a dear friend who's head of uh, um, the Harvard School of Public Health study of suicide in the military with whom I play squash. And he said once, you know, some kids have an ability to just be resilient mm -hmm. and some kids don't. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm one of those people that goes through an experience and doesn't evaluate it until later. So even though I can actually remember being nine and having my head shoved in a toilet, um, I don't, I don't remember being scared, and I don't remember screaming at her. I just remember, as I said in the thing, is this all? Is this all there is? You know, so, and I've had a lot of experiences like that. I mean, the Peace Corps was, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. So I don't kind of, I'm not very reflective until after. And that's why I said I didn't really reflect on this book until after it was written. Well, your reflection is a gift to everybody because I think that in being brave, you inspire others to be brave. Thank you. And so how can we buy your book, Dina? 
Oh, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um, the book is on Amazon.com, and it's on BarnesandNoble.com, and you can certainly get it through iUniverse. And if you like it, you can even leave a comment uh, on Amazon.com. Well, it's an excellent book, Farago, Memories of Marky and Me, and that is F-A-R-R-A-G-O, Farago. And if people want to get in touch with you personally, um, do you have a way for them to contact you? Sure. Um, you can contact me at droberts at thebraygroup.com. I do work at Boston Conservatory, so that's droberts at bostonconservatory.edu, or check me out on Facebook. And for those people who are taking inspiration from you at the fact that you became, that your first time effort at writing a book was so excellent and that you feel so proud about saying, I am an author, yeah. what advice would you have for them? Um, if you like to write, get up there and do it. Um, Al Gore in the movie, An uh, Inconvenient Truth, has an expression that goes, when you pray, move your feet. And that's exactly what I would say to anybody who wants to write. I love it. <laughs> Dina, thank you so much for being with us today. And it's been such an enlightening and inspiring episode here on It's All Right with Suzette. And we will see you again next time. Thank Thanks you. for being with us. Thank you, Suzette.